Okay. I think we'll see how long this lasts. So, uh, seven twenty seven. I will see. Um, okay. So, we are in John chapter eight. My name is Douglas Griffin. Was Bible study? Just catching us up. Jesus is at this festival of tabernacles. It's October. He's going to be uh, crucified in March of the following year. He knows that. But he's focused in Jerusalem. He has been all over Judea, mostly in Galilee and Samaria and different parts. But uh, he's focusing now in Jerusalem, especially on the heart hardness of the hearts of the Pharisees. I've got to get to some of them because they're all going to crucify me and they're not going to hell. Even though me being crucified is part of God's plan, they're going to be crucifying me because they don't believe I'm the Messiah. Uh, and so you can crucify me or not crucify me, but you have to believe I'm the Messiah because that's the only way you're going to get into heaven. That's all. You just have to believe that I'm Jesus is God. And then I'm dying for your sins as opposed to you're killing me because I'm a nuisance. Because then I can't let you into heaven. This is God's stuff. I'm like, he's just asking for belief. Not even a perfect life, just belief. So Jesus is trying to reach the Pharisees to try to say, I am, I promise you, I promise you, I am the Messiah. So um, uh, we've had three feasts this year, Passover, Pentecost, and now the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last day of the feast, when they're pouring all these waters out, uh, symbolic of God blessing the world and bringing life to the world. Jesus says, I'm the living water. That's me. That's talking about me. So this causes a stir, and the Pharisees have a meeting on the side and said, we got to get that guy. Um, meanwhile, right afterwards, they take Jesus and uh, they bring this woman caught in adultery to him. And I was explaining that the law was written I need to show you that you're a sinner. It's, it's, it's not any different than today. I need to show you that you're a sinner and that there's forgiveness for sin. The law had two parts. Penalty for sin is death. You need to know that so that you'll go ahead and take the cure. If you think, ah, what's the big deal? Then you won't take the cure. And the cure is blood must be shed. So they were supposed to take a lamb and shed its blood or the goat or bull, depending on what type of offering it was and go to the priest and get absolution for their sin. Every day. They had to do this every day. Because God says, you know you sin every day. So take care of this every day. And um, uh, they came to Jesus with them on adultery, like, ha ha, she's supposed to be executed. They said, yeah, if you're sinless, you can execute it. But if you're not, you got to leave her alone because we're all sinners. So why are you pointing out her sin? So we think Jesus was writing sins he could have been writing verses about sin because when they read it, they left. He says, well, if you're out without sin, you go ahead. And then he's writing and they went, oh, and then they left. So it's probably something to do with sins, right? So they leave and Jesus tells them to the woman, says, I'm not, I don't condemn you. That's not the whole point. of. The point is you're forgiven. I'm not here to tell you what a sin you are. I'm here to tell you how much forgiven you are. Goes without saying you're a sinner. We're all sinners. Who's, why is somebody pointing out your sin specifically? Like, you know, you're the one. It's like, really? Because you're all the one too. So what they need to be is going to point at somebody, point at Jesus and say, that's the answer for our sin. There it is. I've been forgiven. Yeah, I've been forgiven. So now that this is over, Jesus is in the, um, well, he's in the treasury part. He's near the treasury part of the, uh, of the temple. The temple had several parts and several different rooms. So, I seem to be okay. I'm, I'm staring at it. It has been four whole minutes and it hasn't stopped yet. So, I'm going to assume that this video is going to keep going. So, um, I almost am tempted to eliminate the other one. Well, never mind. I'll do it later. Okay. So, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12. So he's just dealt with the woman from adultery, with, from adultery. She's up from adultery, Kansas. The woman caught in adultery and sent her on her way. Says then, this is immediately after, so this is still the same day of the feast. The feast has just ended, but now it's evening. 
It says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Why is he saying this? Because, which we find out later, he's in the woman's portion, um, teaching from there, which is really interesting. Uh, but the, the, the men were able to, you, they had, a, they had a, a hall where the men were, and then there was a hall where the women were. And in between were the Sanhedrin. They were right in between. And Jesus actually was teaching for the women. And they had just brought the women kind of adultery to him there, right? And so, um, and which is the most open, like anybody could hear. The men, anybody could listen there. So everybody is hearing him teach. It was the most open place in this whole temple complex. The temple is like a complex. So he's teaching there. And they, they have this huge candle, uh, huge candelabra was there. Now, every night of the festival, not only did they pour out water, but they lit these huge candles. They were on these steps coming down, like huge, like taller than a person, right? Um, and uh, this, this night, they weren't lit because the festival's over. So they're, so they're aware of just this one little light being where the women are. And, and how they're in darkness. They're like aware. So Jesus says, you know, I'm the light. You don't see how you have to light all these lights. I'm the light. So he's telling them as they light this one little candle, that's me. I'm the light. See how this little bit of light is enough to light up this whole area. I'm the light of the world. And he who follows me, you won't be in darkness, but have the light of life. So it won't just be, yay, I can see wherever I go. <laughs> but but he's using it as a metaphor, like we need a flashlight in the darkness. I'm that flashlight showing you where not to step and don't step on that and watch out for this. And oh, you're looking for your paper. There it is. That's me. I'm that. Per I'm your light of your life. Wherever you go, you just step wherever I tell you to step. You'll be OK. So um, now John is pointing this out because Matthew, Mark and Luke covered Jesus's life. But, but John felt like they missed a whole bunch of good stuff. So. He's bringing this up uh, because he says there are certain themes that Jesus spoke on that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are simply reporting what he did. And then he did this, and then he did this. I'm giving meaning to everything. Here's why he did it, and here's what it means. So uh, he started off his whole book, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now he starts off his book just like Genesis starts off. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was what he starts it off the same way because he's trying to call their minds to that because he knows the first thing that God said was light let there be light he didn't say let there be light he said light and and as it came out of his mouth light just sprung across the universe it, right and it's been moving ever since you know how the stars and the universe is just expanding and moving it's never stopped so from that void like where do all these planets and all these stars you know these pictures we're getting back from the Hubble so, not the Hubble the other one um, yeah. Web, yes, the web. These phenomenal, startling pictures of how the lights looked uh, three million years ago, uh, and it's all moving. And, and but where did it come from? They're all moving away from what? The mouth of God, <laughs> as he spoke, light, and it just came out. So that's the first thing he did. So John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and that word that came out of God's mouth that was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is John 1, 1, 1, 2. And he says, all things were made through him. And without him, was nothing made. So when he made the planets, when he made this, what? That was God and, and his word, which are not two separate things. I am what I say, right? Uh, and so he's saying that the voice of God was actually Jesus, you know, in creation, and without him, nothing was made that was made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness. And the darkness didn't even get it. So that's why John starts off his book. He wants you to know there are three things that, try, that Jesus is trying to get across to us. That he's truth, that he's light, and that he's life. So these things that Jesus is doing are lessons. They're not just, and then he did this and he did that. Because if you read Mark, Luke, and Matthew, which are lovely books, they just kind of list the things that Jesus did, which is great on its own. But John's saying, here's why he did it. So 
Um, and Isaiah, and Jesus is saying this because of um, Isaiah chapter 49. Hey, Donna, yay. Glad you all made it and Rodney, good, okay. Sean didn't want us to just, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm actually read yours later, but you're right, Rodney. Okay, Isaiah chapter 49, verse five, it says, and now the Lord says, and who's the Lord? The Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant. So this is God who formed Jesus to be a servant. Now, Jesus is God, but he prepared a body for him and put a butt right, and so now he's God in the flesh. But he's still God, he's not like he's not God. He's just God in the flesh. So he prepared, he, he formed me from the womb to be a servant. So when he put him in the womb of Mary, he was he was there to be his servant, right? Then it says in uh, John forty nine five to bring Jacob back to him. So Jacob, when Jacob, there's two names for Jacob, right? Jacob and Israel. He says your name is Jacob, but I'm gonna call you Israel. But whenever you're being disobedient, rebellion, that's the Jacob side. So they, when we see Jacob and Israel in the Bible, just know that God is saying to bring Jacob back to him because you're Israel, but sometimes you be acting like Jacob. Because uh, Jesus talked like that. He said, be acting like. So, so that Israel is gathered to him. See, uh, Jacob left, but Israel's is gathered back to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. So this is Jesus talking about himself, right? Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So like, you're God, but it's going to be, you know, I'm going to put you in this little vessel. He says, uh, and to restore, this is all the things you're going to do. And to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is saying, I'm that light. Remember how it said that he would be a light to the nations, the Gentiles, I mean, to the nations, so that you can be my salvation to the earth? I'm that light. He said you'll be a light. That's me. Hello. I'm the light. It's not, it's not a coincidence. We're here and we just lit that candle. Me. So in John chapter 8, verse 13, the Pharisees are, oh my God, he just said he was water. Now he's saying he's light. Earlier he said he was the bread. What is he, everything? Yes. So the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, so your witness is not true. And that goes back to, it takes two witnesses to establish, they never take the testimony of one person because one person gives us about something up. So it takes two witnesses. So you bear witness of yourself. So there, you're the only one that says that about you. John chapter eight, verse 14. And Jesus answered and said to them, uh, even if I bear witness of myself, turns out my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. So, because I came from God, I'm going back to God. So, so even if that was true, my witness is true. You don't even know where you came from. You just showed up. I know I was, I prepared a body for myself and got in it and I'm going back up. You don't know where you came from or where, and you don't certainly don't know where you're going because if you know where you're going, you would act differently. So, you do not know where I came from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one according to the flesh, right? I, according to the heart is what he's saying. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. And yet I'm not judging anybody. But if I were to judge and say, well, you're going to go to hell, you're going to heaven, I'm right. So, for I am not alone, surprised, I actually, I'm not bearing witness of myself by myself. For I am with the Father who sent me. So there actually is two of us, uh, even though we're one. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And that's what he's been saying along. When I healed that person, God did it. I said, Father, do it. And so he's bearing witness. He's backing me up. He's bearing witness that this is my beloved son. Remember when I first got baptized and a voice came from heaven? This is my beloved son. Hear him. That was God bearing witness of me. So I don't know what you're talking about. Can, have you not seen my life? Hello? you not seen who I am? So... Again, he's trying to wake up the Pharisees. So then they said to him, verse 19, where is your father? What are you talking about? My father bears. Who is your father? Because we know Joseph is dead. So what are you talking about? Jesus answered, oh, you know neither me nor my father. That's what's so sad. Because if you had known me, you would have known my father also. Like, you know, if you really knew God, then you would know what I'm saying is from God. But you don't know God. You don't know me. 
if you'd really listened to me, you would have realized you've seen the father. You're saying, where's your father? If you see me, you've seen the father. I'm, I'm him in flesh. You don't have to wonder what God thinks. You don't have to wonder. This is just my tiny pet peeve. I'm just stopping for a commercial. We need to look at everything that Jesus said and did because that is what God is saying to us. People make up a lot of stuff. But we have to focus on what Jesus said and did. And if whatever Jesus taught, that's what is important. And what Jesus did not teach, why are we teaching it? Because I've heard people just make up stuff. I said, Jesus never taught that. If that were true, true, Jesus would have said, you know what's important? Let's just stop right now. You need to know that this is important. But there's a, there are several opportunities, and we'll get to them in John, where, jo where Jesus could have said, this is a truth. And he didn't because it's not a thing. So whatever Jesus is saying is what the Father wanted to communicate to us. And that's what, if we just focused on every, the, the words of Jesus, we'd be great. Okay, so, which is what Paul was focusing on. And Paul's explaining, here's what Jesus meant. Okay, so he says, if you had seen me, you would know the Father. And if you knew the Father, then you'd know me. You don't know anyone. You don't know either one. So John chapter 8, verse 20 says, and these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. So why does he want us to know that he's in the treasury so I'm in the temple? Again, in the women's porch, so there's the women's hall. Now there's the main part uh, where the priest went in, there's a part where they did the sacrifices. There's, there's just different sections. There's a part for the nations where the Gentiles were allowed to come. So you didn't have to be Jewish. You could be a Gentile. There's, they had a part where you can go and worship the God of Israel. The part where the men were, the part where the women were, all these different parts, all right? In the women's part is where they would bring like these treasure chests and people would come in and give their offerings and the Sanhedrin and, and the Sadducees would be like, ooh, bring more offering, bring more offering. This is fantastic. Fill it up, right? Uh, and they were just only about the offering, which bugs God. It's when you know that bugs God when we have a whole service about offering. Don't see it anywhere in the Bible. Okay, so, uh, so that bugged Jesus. Now he's in the treasury, and they're letting us know, John's letting us know where he is because in the treasury... They, they brought the, he was near the treasury. They would, he didn't literally, he wasn't, because it's not that big of a room. But they, it was right next door to the treasury and they would bring the chest out into the women's hall. And that's where he was teaching, right next to the treasury. They brought the chest out because they didn't care about the women. Now nah, just put it in the women's part. We don't, you know, see how they are. And so people were giving offering um, and they lit the candle. Okay, here's what else happened there. John didn't put it because you've already read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you know what happened in the treasury, in the woman's place. You know what happened, right? No. Tell us. You're the teacher. Why are you asking us? Hello. Okay. In Luke chapter 12, verse 41, it says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. So again, he's not literally in the treasury room teaching, but he's right across from it, right? There's, there's the room where the treasury is. They brought the chest out into the women's place. So he's right next to the treasury. So he should have said he taught next to the treasury. So now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. This is Luke 12. And he saw how the people put money into the treasury. to lines of these treasure chests, right? And many who were rich put in much. And, went, oh. and they did it to make sure everybody saw them. Bugs Jesus. Bugs God. Bugs. Sometimes it's, I've seen it a good thing. You know, I'm giving, and it's like encourage other people to give. And sometimes it's just all about, I gave $100. And it's just about everybody, oh, aren't you wonderful? So we have to be careful because this is a flip like that really bugs Jesus. So, and many who were rich put in much. Luke 12, 42 now. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites. Yes, it's that story, right? This, this, is, this happened right there. John just doesn't bring it up. Uh, which makes a quadrant. So it's like a quarter. Like she didn't have much, which reminds me of the story in a second. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who were given to the treasury. Because he wanted them to understand how God looks at it. So that billionaire who gave a hundred dollars, that's like you 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 that fell out of your pocket on the way to the bathroom. You didn't that but this widow, 
she's really giving. It says, surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance. They didn't even miss it. They put in out of, he says, but she gave out of her poverty. She, out of her poverty, put in all that she had her whole livelihood. So I just want you to know, God is looking at that. Uh, not that you have to, so you must, every single time you go, give everything, go to the bank and just empty it out. That's not what he's saying. He's letting them know, I know everybody's impressed. Ooh, he gave 10. Ooh, he gave a, ooh, he gave me that. But that was nothing to that person. This widow is saying, I love this temple so much. I love the work that's going on here. I'm giving, and so just say, in God's economy, that was actually more. Because he, he's not looking at the amount. He's not impressed with the amount. He's impressed with our obedience to whatever he told us to give. He may told, tell you to give a quarter. And he's, oh, you gave, me, you gave all that I told you to give. Yay, I only told you to give a nickel and you gave that whole nickel. So, oh, I told you to give $1,000, you only gave 100 But everybody applauded you, but they don't know what I told you to give. So you didn't really give what I told you to give. So he's impressed with our obedience, whatever it is that he put in our hearts to give. It just reminds me of, I, there was a prayer breakfast at my church, and there was a homeless guy that uh, we've been taking care of. Some of us have been, you know, helping him out. And, but at, and so we invited him to this prayer breakfast, right? And, and everybody's there. They're looking good. Everybody looks good. Because if you go to these Baptist Methodist prayer breakfasts, everybody looks good. And uh, I whispered something to the pastor about this homeless guy. So the pastor got up and said, there's someone here with a need, and we want to take up an offering for him. And so, for this person, didn't even say it was a man or woman. So people gave 10, 20, oh, I'll get, you know, which is fine, lovely. No, I'm not mad at that. So afterwards, I went to count the, with the pastor to count the money so I could give it to him. He had no idea. He had no idea. And we found a quarter. But now people gave 10, they gave 20. Who put a quarter? And I realized and remembered, that's all he had left in the world. That's all he had left was that quarter. And he put it in the offering because he heard that somebody was in need. And he's thinking, well, I got a quarter. And there's somebody there who's got nothing. So let me get, so he gave in the offering, which still gets me because that's all he had in the world. And he put it in the offering for somebody that he thought was worse off than him. I'm here at a breakfast eating and somebody's got nothing. So to his shock, we gave, you know, he was shocked. He didn't know the money was for him. Anyway, so that, so Jesus so again, if God told somebody that day, give $100, and they thought, you know, if I give 10, that's good. God's not happy. Everybody else is like, oh, thank you for that $10. But God's like, boo. But if he pressed in this person's heart, give a quarter. He, he put in the quarter and got back, you know, $300. And that, he was in shock. He was in tears. He couldn't believe, you know. That helped him buy a plate. We got, he got a little room for, the, for like a week. Oh. It's like, oh, my God, I get to live off the street, you know. Anyway, so that happened in the treasury. Also in the treasury, uh, Jesus, this is where Jesus went the first and the last time he came to the temple. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who brought, bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it the den of thieves. That's where it happened in the woman's section. Because they would take over the one. See how they are? Oh, the woman's only in this section. We'll just bring all the tables in here. So he knew he was going to be back there. So he's trying to give people a lesson on what's important in giving and what's not important in giving. And some of you people who are, think you're making money for the church and buying stuff, I'm going to come back and throw all that out because it's not about how much money you make. It's just about do I have your heart or not? And when I ask you to do something, are you going to do it or not? That's all I need. That's all what God wants to know. Uh, Matthew chapter 27. Here's the last time we hear about the treasury and, and the temple. It says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. So he waited and he saw when they sentenced Jesus to death. Judas thought up until the last second, well, if he really is the Messiah, he'll stop this. Because and G Judas is trying to put Jesus in a position where he'll do what Judas wants him to do. And we try to put God in a position where he'll do what he wants us to do. God, I'm trying to put you, I'm trying to make you do what's right. And he's trying to make Jesus overthrow the government. So he's betraying Jesus, not because he hates him, 
but because he thinks he's supposed to lead some sort of riot, and yet he's being quiet and letting them take him. And so it says once he saw that they were condemned and that he didn't lift his hand to do what a Messiah could do, he thought, oh no, because he wasn't listening. I've condemned the Messiah. I'm going to have to kill myself because not still not hearing, this is part of the plan, Judas. You're going to, and so we'll see when we get when we get there that a lot of things that Judas, Jesus was saying to Judas was to save his life. Judas, you're about to do this horrible thing and you're going to feel so bad about it. So I'm trying to help you. Uh, anyway, so he says he was remorseful and he bought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Saying, so he goes right up to the treasury and saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us, what you did? You, you see to it. You keep that money. We gave you that money. So then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. Where? Right in front of the treasury. Right where Jesus was now teaching about money. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, should we put it in the treasury? Should we just turn around? And they said, nah, it's not lawful to put these into the treasury because they are the price of blood. So we certainly can't, you know, th this bought somebody's death. So let's go out and we'll just buy some land with it. And they did. That's it. You know, let's invest in real estate. God would like that. Okay, so he's in the treasury. I'm just pointing out that Jesus is aware of everything that's about to happen there. And, and he's teaching about treasury. John points out in John chapter 8, verse 20, and no one laid hands on him. Now, here's why he brought this up. is because just in John chapter 7, just that morning, after Jesus had said that morning, I am the river of life. Uh, and they, remember, they had a meeting right after that, John chapter 7, verse 45. Then the officers came to the chief priest and the Pharisees said to them, why have you not brought him? Because they said, go get him. And the officers answered, well, no one ever spoke like this man. I mean, no one ever claimed to be the Messiah and like that. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? None of the rulers, of, none of us Pharisees have believed. But this crowd that does not know him, they're crazy. So then Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, because they said none of us Pharisees believe in him. So Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, hey, hey, duh, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? You're about to put him in jail, and for what? What has he done other than quote scripture? And then they answered him and said, say, are you, also, you must also be from Galilee. Of course, Jesus wasn't from Galilee. That's where God's disciples. Search and look for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. And we already went over this a couple weeks ago, but that's not what the Bible says. And everyone went to his own house. Okay, we're going to get him. So Jesus is teaching openly in the, Jesus hasn't gone nowhere. We got to get that man. And so John points out, and by the way, no one came and got him, even though the Sanhedrin council was 10 feet from him. <laughs> they were afraid to get him. So John chapter 8, the last part of verse 20 says, for his hour had not yet come. So if God is determined not, something's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. If, if it's your hour, it's going to happen. But if it's not your hour, you can go wherever God sends you. You can say whatever he says. You can do whatever he says to do. You do not have to worry. Because if it's not your hour, they cannot harm you. Man cannot harm you in any way. So what, whatever it is, if you feel, if you've prayed, and God says, I want you to go, and that could be going vacation. I don't mean you'd have to be going some mission somewhere. But God says, yeah, I want you to go enjoy yourself. And go get, oh, I'm scared. Why? If God is sending you. Do not be afraid. If it's not your hour, you can preach right next to the Sanhedrin who've just sent people to kill you, and they ain't going to touch you. And Jesus said, I'm, gonna be, I'm planting. I shall not be moved, and I am killing you. I'm not going. He is staying there. I'm in Jerusalem. You know, I keep going and coming. And coming. Nah, staying, because you can't get me until it's time. And then even then, I'm going to say to you, you can only get me because God said it's time. So I know you think, ooh, you've done much. You have done nothing. So uh, it's all up to God and we have to live in less fear, okay? And live in more obedience to God and then we don't have to worry. Oh, good. God, God said it's okay. Then I'm not going to worry. Okay. So thank you. And I'm so sorry that I've had, but I think I've discovered a secret. So uh, uh, of how I'm going to do this. Uh, I, we'll see. Next time we'll find out. Boy, he didn't learn nothing. Uh.
Okay, so thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, and Paul is going to call me. Why'd you get off so early? Because it's time to go. Uh, but I'll be back uh, next week. And on Sunday, we're teaching in the book of Exodus. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.